It gets lonely on the road. I don't blame anyone that thinks about picking up a hitchhiker for some company, yet you really should be careful. Anything could happen when you let a stranger in the truck with you. I picked up a hitchhiker once on a long trip, and here's why I will never do it again. Out on the long stretches of Interstate Nevada, there can be upwards of over 275 miles of empty road to cross before you see civilization again. That gives a man more time to think than he should probably have. It was just such a time as that when I noticed a woman walking on the road out in the middle of nowhere. Thinking that picking her up would give me someone to talk to, I was happy to see her thumb go up as I approached. When I stopped, I remember thinking that this poor woman must have been through something awful. She was wearing a long sleeve shirt, black jeans, boots, and had a black backpack on her back. With her long red hair and blue eyes, she might have been pretty if her face hadn't been caked in dirt. Her clothes didn't have holes in them, and her hair hadn't been matted flat against her head. I pulled over and asked her where she was heading. She said that she was going to the next town, so I told her to hop on in. As soon as she entered, a smell filled the cabin. It was kind of like rotting cabbage and vomit all rolled into one. Not wanting to seem like a bad host, I rolled down the window and didn't say a word about the stench. We had a bit of small talk, but her answers didn't always match the questions. When I said it was a nice day, she only replied with fine, thank you. I then said she could get comfortable and take her backpack off. She just moved it from her back and hugged it in her lap. It was like something important was in there. It was about an hour after I'd picked her up that she blurted out of nowhere that it was lucky that I had offered her a ride when I had. When I asked her why that was, her response was that it was because there wasn't any more room in here. It had made some sense, I suppose, because my cab can only hold two people. What bothered me was that she was staring at her backpack when she said that. Not much else was spoken between the two of us until I dropped her off. She said a quick goodbye and hopped out of the truck and walked away. I didn't think about her again until two days later when a news report came on the television at a truck stop I was at. The police were looking for a woman who had been killing truckers. I spit out my coffee when they read her description. She was tall with red hair and blue eyes. She wore long sleeve shirts to hide scars on her arms, jeans, and had a black backpack where she kept the heads of her victims. I think I had gotten lucky that day. Lucky that her backpack had no more room in it for my head. This took place in the 80s before there was widespread cell phone use. I was hauling a load through the middle of nowhere in Nebraska when my truck conked out on me for some reason. Now I had a few tools and knew my way around the engine well enough, but I couldn't find what the problem was. My CB radio was out of range to call for any assistance so it looked like I was stuck there. Fortunately, I was in the edge of a large cornfield, which meant there had to be a house nearby. With this in mind, I climbed up on the trailer to get a look around. Not even a quarter mile down the road, there was a house. It was my hope that they would let me use their phone to get some help. It wasn't a hard walk or anything. I remember the weather was fairly cool that day. As soon as I began to walk down the long driveway, which had rows of corn on either side of it, I got a strange feeling about the place. I couldn't quite place it but something was off. Maybe it was the air that felt dead as soon as I went down the driveway, or it could have been the smell of rotting vegetation that tipped the scale in my eerie meter. But either way, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. One thing I did notice on my approach was that one of the blinds in the windows was cracked open as I started towards the house. Then as I got closer, it suddenly closed. Obviously, I was being watched. Then again, if I lived out in the middle of nowhere and some stranger came to my house, I'd be wondering why as well. I got to the door and knocked on it. There was no answer. As this was my only option at the time to get help, I wasn't about to give up, so I rang the doorbell. This time I could hear feet moving around inside and something that sounded like a scuffle. Then it went quiet again. I was starting to second guess whether help from this place was worth it or not. In a last ditch effort before I gave up and went back to trying the CB again, I hollered out that I needed help. Again, no answer. I turned and was about to walk away when the door opened a crack. A small wisp of a voice asked me what I needed. I explained the situation with my truck and asked to use the phone. The voice said I could come in to use the phone, but then I would have to leave again because they were having a problem. 
Not like I wanted to stay there long anyways. I agreed and the person behind the door opened up. Darkness filled the house. Not a single light was on. Other than that, it was pretty tidy in there. Books on shelves, floors were clean and everything was in its place. When I turned to get a look at the person who had let me in, I was sort of startled to see it was a kid. He had platinum blonde hair, pale white skin with piercing blue eyes, and a round cherub face. He wasn't very tall, and in all he looked to be about maybe 11 or 12 years old. I asked him if his parents were home. He said they were out at the moment, then led me to the phone. It was in the back, right inside the kitchen. The smell of baking bread filled my nose the closer we got back there, but then there were hints of smoke. Once inside the kitchen, smoke plumed from the oven. Holy shit, kid, you got a fire in here, I hollered out. I ran to open the oven door and asked if he had a towel or some water to put out the flames. The kid didn't respond. He only stared at the fire. I looked at the fire, then I looked at him, then back to the fire, sort of confused by the fact that he didn't react at all that his house might burn down. By the third time, when I looked at the fire, the flames had vanished. I looked back at the kid and saw him quickly wipe some blood from his nose. Huh, it must have blown out somehow, he said. Dumbfounded, I could only nod my head in agreement then shut the oven door. He pointed towards the phone, which I then went to use. I was on hold with dispatch when some loud thumping was heard on the second floor. Without any talking, the kid went up the stairs and into the room where the thumps had come from. I heard a door open right above me, then some smacks rang out. Next, the door closed and the kid could be heard coming down the stairs again. Dispatch told me that they could have another truck there to help in about two hours. I triple gave them my location so I wouldn't have to come back to the house to use the phone again, and then hung up. When I asked the kid what the noise had been, he told me it was raccoons. They had been sneaking in and stealing things from the house. I didn't question it at the time, not when I had to wait for two hours just down the road from this place. He showed me to the door and practically pushed me out. Once on the porch, I could hear the door's deadbolt lock. I stood there in contemplation for a moment until I could feel the eyes of someone on me. When I turned, the blinds on the window behind me swung shut. Didn't really want to get involved with anything and decided to make my way back to my truck. A little ways down the driveway, I could hear a tapping sound like someone knocking on glass, but quietly. I turned to see what it was, but again it was only a blind swinging in the window. Only this time, the window was on the second floor. I figured the best thing to do would be to get back to safety then call the police to let them deal with it, which is exactly what I did. They went to investigate the place, but it was empty when they got there. They said there were traces of blood on the second floor, but they couldn't determine if it was human or not. Forensics weren't the best in the 80s. There was no record of what happened to the owners, and it still haunts me to this day as to what was really going on. Driving long haul truck isn't easy. It especially isn't easy when you're tired and even worse when the weather is bad. The events that I'm about to tell you may sound crazy and they are. I'm not even sure if what I saw was real or not. Out on the open road for so long does things to a person. Highway hypnosis is only one of the main phenomenons described. I've seen people do things out there and not remember them a moment later. I guess the same could be done in reverse. You remember things that never even occurred. That might be the case here, but I'm not sure. It all felt so real, it's hard to believe that it didn't take place. In the same way, no sane person could say it did happen. I'll tell my story and let you be the judge of whether the events are true or not. It was on a long stretch of interstate between Colorado and Kansas. Rain was pouring down in sheets. I had been driving for 10 hours straight. Don't tell anyone, but I didn't take my half hour break after the first 8 hours. That was probably my first mistake. It's just that with only 11 hours to drive in a day, you gotta make it all count sometimes. So there I was in the cab of my truck, tired, piss poor visibility, and nothing but that yellow line in the middle of the road to look at. That's when something off to the right caught my eye. A quick flash of blue light. At first I thought it was a bolt of lightning. There wasn't any thunder though, which struck me as odd. Initially I dismissed it, rubbed my eyes, then went back to watching the road. Not a minute later the blue flicker came back. Now off to that side there was nothing but grasslands and gentle rolling hills. Why the light would flicker didn't make any sense, there was nothing there to block it. Soon however, it began to get closer and closer. The flickering stopped and it became a steady dull glow. 
I was going about 60 miles an hour, yet somehow it was coming up on me. That means it had to be keeping pace with me and coming towards me at the same time, so it would have to be moving kind of diagonal-like. I can't think of anything not man-made that could have kept up with me. I had only 35 minutes left to drive until I called it a night at the next town. Not wanting to stop for anything, I pushed on, even with this unexplainable light that kept coming towards me. By now, it was bright and easy to see, no mistaking it for lightning anymore. This is where it begins to get a little weird. Once it got close enough, the light on it became easy to see as lamps. Even in the downfall, that was clear to make out. The lamp hung on the side of an old covered wagon, like the ones that pioneers used to ride across the plains. It was drawn by two horses. These horses had red glowing eyes and part of their skin appeared to be missing. White from their rib bones could be seen in holes on their flesh. Driving all of this was a man dressed in animal furs. What really got me was that the driver had no head. Well, he did, but it wasn't on his body. It was on the seat next to him. It came alongside of the truck and kept pace with us for about 10 miles. I only looked at it once, then didn't dare look at it again until the man let out a bone-chilling cackle. And that's where we have what was probably my second mistake, because as soon as I looked, he picked up his head and threw it at the side of my rig. It struck with a thunderous boom, almost like an explosion, but it didn't make any flash. My truck veered to the left, into the oncoming lane. Fortunately, there were no other vehicles on the road, otherwise it would have caused a wreck for sure. The back end of the semi fishtailed violently, it was all I could do not to lose control. Up ahead there was a bridge that spanned a river. I'm old enough to remember the legend of Sleepy Hollow and how that horseman couldn't cross the bridge. I only hoped that the same held true for this maniac. A quick downshift and I was back to gaining speed again. I looked over at the headless man, he had drawn a revolver that was pointed right at me. Before he could let off a shot, I shifted again. The echo of the report from his weapon rang in my ears. He sped up to be equal with my cab window, but I shifted one more time and put the pedal down. In the passenger side window I could see that fire had erupted from his neck. Not sure about you, but I took that as a sign that he was really mad. The truck was doing about 75 miles an hour by now. Rain continued to dump and it was hard to see where the bridge was exactly. It wasn't until I was almost on it that the safety reflectors told me where the edge of it was. I steered quickly to the left as the side of my truck brushed against the guardrail. Sparks flew from the metal on metal collision while curses flew from my mouth. Once I was a ways past the bridge, I had to stop to inspect for damage to the semi. Out in the rain I looked back the way I would come. On the other side of the bridge, a bright orange flame still burned. Dumbstruck, I stood there until a bullet ricocheted off of the road in front of me. The inspection would have to wait. Back into the cab I went and I didn't stop until I hit the town and my shift ended. When I did finally look at the damage, sure enough, the right side of the trailer was dented in with scrape marks all down the side from the bridge. On the side of the cab was a dark black circle and on the trailer, just above all the scrapes, was a small hole. What I tell myself so I don't go completely crazy is that lightning did strike the side of my cab, which left the black spot. The scrapes are from the bridge of course, which I hit because I was tired. And the hole? Well, there must have been some kind of branch or something by the bridge that caused that. The rest of the events were sort of a white line fever or me sleeping with my eyes open. Not really sure, but you can be the judge of what is true or not.